Today we will be examining the physiology of the autonomic nervous system. Before we get started, let's first determine how much you already know about the autonomic nervous system by answering three multiple choice questions. Question 1. In which of the following locations would you be most likely to find adrenergic receptors? A. The motor implant and skeletal muscle. B. The dendrites of sympathetic postganglionic neurons. C. The dendrites of parasympathetic postganglionic neurons. D. The plasma membranes within effector organs with sympathetic innervation. Or E. The synaptic embulb of sympathetic preganglionic neurons. Did you answer response D? Congratulations, that's correct. Question 2. In the autonomic nervous system, A. Preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions synapse with postganglionic neurons in the paravertebral ganglia. B. Nicotinic receptors are usually excitatory, while muscarinic receptors can be excitatory or inhibitory. C. The neurotransmitter released from postganglionic parasympathetic neurons binds to nicotinic receptors. D. Cholinergic receptors can be either nicotinic or adrenergic. Or E. Stimulation of either alpha-1 or beta-1 receptors usually leads to smooth muscle contraction. If you chose response B, you are correct. Question 3. Which of the following effects would be most likely to occur due to an increase in parasympathetic output? A. An increase in heart rate and contractility. B. Fight or flight responses. C. An increase in digestive processes. D. Vasodilation of systemic arterioles. Or E an increase in blood glucose. The correct answer is response C, an increase in digestive processes. How did you do? If you answered all of the questions correct, you have a very good understanding of the autonomic nervous system and this video could serve as a review for you to refresh your knowledge when needed. If you missed one or more of the questions, this video will help you to understand more about the physiology of the autonomic nervous system. Let's begin. This flowchart shows you the various divisions of the nervous system. Today, we will be focusing on the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic division, which is often referred to as the fight or flight division, and the parasympathetic division, commonly referred to as the rest and digest division. As you sit watching this video, the autonomic nervous system is unconsciously controlling many of the essential functions of your body. How dilated or constricted are your pupils to allow you to view this video? How fast is your heart beating? How dilated or constricted are the blood vessels of your body to maintain your blood pressure? Are your airways dilated enough to maintain proper oxygen levels? When did you last eat? Is your blood sugar within an acceptable range? The autonomic nervous system is constantly operating to maintain a staggering number of variables within a proper homeostatic range. Thus, an understanding of the autonomic nervous system is essential to understanding how the human body works. Let's now look at the specifics of the autonomic nervous system. One thing that all of the divisions of the nervous system have in common 
is that they contain neurons, the cells of the nervous system. Neurons communicate with one another through the release of chemicals called neurotransmitters from their synaptic end bulbs. While there are many different types of neurotransmitters, two common ones are acetylcholine and norepinephrine. For example, in the somatic nervous system, motor neurons send signals to excite skeletal muscle cells. When stimulated, the motor neurons have an action potential that spreads down the axon. This stimulates the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine from vesicles in the synaptic end bulb. Acetylcholine then diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to specific receptors on the motor end plate of the skeletal muscle cell. These receptors are specific to acetylcholine and are called nicotinic cholinergic receptors. The binding of acetylcholine to the receptors leads to contraction of the skeletal muscle cell. Looking at our two main neurotransmitters, we can see that there are many different types of receptors that these chemicals can bind to. The response of a given cell to the release of neurotransmitters depends on which type of receptors are present and the type of cell itself. Acetylcholine binds to cholinergic receptors and norepinephrine binds to adrenergic receptors. There are two different types of cholinergic receptors, nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors are usually excitatory, while muscarinic receptors can be either excitatory or inhibitory. In skeletal muscle, we saw that the acetylcholine interacted with nicotinic cholinergic receptors, leading to muscle contraction. Norepinephrine binds to adrenergic receptors on the target cells. There are four different types of adrenergic receptors throughout the body. Alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors usually lead to smooth muscle contraction when excited, while beta-1 and beta-2 receptors usually lead to smooth muscle relaxation when stimulated. Now that we have an understanding of the different types of neurotransmitters and receptors, let's look further in detail at these concepts in the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for the unconscious activities of the body, such as your heart rate, blood pressure, or movement of materials through the GI tract. There are two different divisions of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic division. The sympathetic nervous system is often referred to as the fight or flight system. This name is derived from the fact that it is initiated during times of mental or physical stress to the body. This could include such varying situations as encountering a hungry tiger, having mental anxiety over an upcoming test, or developing low blood sugar from not eating breakfast before class. The main goal of the sympathetic nervous system is to mobilize the body's resources in order to withstand the stressor. While we tend to associate the sympathetic nervous system with extreme events of stress, it is also responsible for controlling the functions of many organ systems on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is referred to as the rest and digest system. It would be stimulated when there are minimal stressors to the body and nutrients are widely available. For example, this relaxed goat at a petting zoo after a meal would be largely experiencing parasympathetic drive. The goal of the parasympathetic division of the nervous system is to conserve and restore the body's resources. Both divisions of the autonomic nervous system contain preganglionic and postganglionic neurons. The preganglionic neurons have cell bodies within the central nervous system. They release neurotransmitters onto the postganglionic neurons. Postganglionic neurons then release neurotransmitters onto effector organs or tissues spread throughout the body. 
Note that in the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neurons are short, while the postganglionic neurons are long. The opposite arrangement occurs in the parasympathetic nervous system, with long preganglionic neurons and short postganglionic neurons. Let's take a closer look first at the sympathetic nervous system. In the sympathetic nervous system, the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons are located within the thoracolumbar region and spinal cord segments T1 through L3. The pre- and postganglionic neurons synapse in the para- and prevertebral ganglia. The long postganglionic neurons then release neurotransmitters to control the activities of tissues such as smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. In the parasympathetic nervous system, the cell bodies of the preganglionic neurons are located in the craniosacral regions of the central nervous system. The preganglionic neurons are long and synapse with the postganglionic neurons near or in the effector organs. Once again, the effector organs can consist of smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands. Please pause the video and take a moment to complete these portions of the table. Let's check your answers. How did you do? If you found that you missed several of these responses, feel free to go back and review the video. Now that we have a general idea of the arrangement of neurons in the autonomic nervous system, let's look at the different neurotransmitters which are utilized. In the sympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neurons release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors on the postganglionic neurons. Most of the postganglionic neurons then release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Norepinephrine then binds to adrenergic receptors on the membrane of the effector organs. The type of adrenergic receptors would depend on the target tissue itself and could be alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, or beta-2. Thus, even though most postganglionic neurons release norepinephrine, the responses of different cells could vary widely from one another based on the receptors present in their membrane as well as on the downstream signaling pathway. There are two main exceptions in the arrangement of the sympathetic nervous system. At the sweat glands, the postganglionic sympathetic neurons do not release norepinephrine. Instead, they release acetylcholine, which binds to muscarinic cholinergic receptors. At the adrenal gland, the preganglionic neurons travel directly to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland itself then releases epinephrine and norepinephrine into the general circulation. Approximately 80% of the final product of the adrenal gland is epinephrine and 20% of the final product is norepinephrine. In the parasympathetic nervous system, the preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, which binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors. 
you will notice that this is the same setup that we saw in the sympathetic nervous system. However, in the parasympathetic nervous system, the postganglionic neurons release acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to muscarinic cholinergic receptors in the membrane of effector organs. Let's pause the video once again to complete the following columns in your autonomic worksheet. You can now check your answers. The autonomic divisions of the nervous system often have what are referred to as reciprocal innervations. What does this mean? Most organs of the body receive input from both the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, but they often cause different effects. An analogy would be that the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions are in a game of tug of war against one another. For example, let's consider the example of heart rate. Both the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the nervous system innervate the sinoatrial or SA node of the heart and can affect the heart rate. The parasympathetic nervous system, when it pulls, would tend to decrease the heart rate towards a lower number of beats per minute. The sympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, would tend to pull the heart rate higher. Thus, the two autonomic divisions are in a game of tug of war against one another. Which one wins? That depends on afferent sensory signals about different conditions in the body, such as blood pressure. The reciprocal innervations have also been referred to in the literature as antagonistic effects, as the sympathetic and parasympathetic outputs would tend to oppose one another. In very isolated cases throughout the body, the sympathetic and parasympathetic outflows may actually work with one another in a complementary fashion to accomplish a common effect. In other cases, the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions may have different effects but act synergistically to control a given function. An example of a synergistic effect exists within the male reproductive physiology. The parasympathetic nervous system innervation leads to erection in males, while the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the ejaculatory process. It is important to note that in most cases within the body, the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system do operate in an antagonistic fashion. There are some limited locations, however, in which this tug-of-war game does not exist at all. Some organs of the body only contain sympathetic innervation. These include the sweat glands, vascular smooth muscle in the walls of blood vessels, pilomotor muscles of the skin, the liver, adipose or fat tissue, and the kidneys. In each of these locations, regulation would occur by either increasing or decreasing the amount of sympathetic output. In this case, multiple inputs could be stimulating or inhibiting the sympathetic output in order to maintain homeostasis. 
For example, if sympathetic drive to vascular smooth muscle increased, this would result in constriction of a blood vessel. If the sympathetic drive to vascular smooth muscle decreased, it would result in dilation of the blood vessel. Multiple inputs would be controlling this process to ensure proper blood pressure and flow. If we examine some of the specific outcomes of the sympathetic versus parasympathetic outflow, we can see that they differ widely from one another. Sympathetic output would tend to mobilize resources by increasing heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory function, and oxygen and nutrient delivery to essential organs such as the heart and skeletal muscle. At the same time, sympathetic output would also tend to turn off non-essential processes for immediate survival, such as the digestive and urinary functions. If we compare the two divisions, we can see that the parasympathetic nervous system has many antagonistic effects, which are shown here surrounded in green boxes. This allows the parasympathetic nervous system to conserve the body's resources during the rest and digest phases. Let's finish our worksheet by comparing the physiological effects of the autonomic nervous system. You can now check your answers. Now that you have an understanding of the basics of the autonomic nervous system, let's apply that information to solve three different cases that you might encounter in the future. Case number one, a new patient presents to your practice complaining of dry mouth and eyes. You determine that the patient has limited salivary and lacrimal flow, but has viable tissue to produce these fluids. What might you prescribe to help your patient produce more of these glandular fluids? A. Medication that mimics acetylcholine release from the postganglionic parasympathetic receptors acting on cholinergic receptors in these glands. B. Medication that mimics acetylcholine release from the postganglionic sympathetic receptors acting on cholinergic receptors in these glands. C. Medication that mimics norepinephrine release from the postganglionic parasympathetic receptors acting on adrenergic receptors in these glands. D. Medication that mimics norepinephrine release from the postganglionic sympathetic receptors acting on adrenergic receptors in these glands. Or E. Medication that mimics acetylcholine release from the postganglionic parasympathetic receptors acting on adrenergic receptors in these glands. Did you answer response A? The parasympathetic division of the nervous system acts to increase digestive functions, such as salivary flow. 
Thus, we are looking for a medication that will stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, eliminating answer choices B and D. We can eliminate response C because we learned in the video that postganglionic parasympathetic neurons release acetylcholine, not norepinephrine. For response E, we also learned that acetylcholine binds to cholinergic, not adrenergic receptors, thus eliminating this answer choice. So the correct answer to case one is A. Case two. An accidental injection of 2% lidocaine with norepinephrine into the trigeminal artery would cause which of the following clinical physiological conditions in your patient? A. Norepinephrine from this injection is not a naturally occurring neurotransmitter of concern. B. Stimulation of adrenergic alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors resulting in constriction of small blood vessels in the bronchial mucosa. C. Stimulation of adrenergic alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors causing inhibitory effects that decrease the rate and force of heart contractions. D. Stimulation of cholinergic beta-1 and beta-2 receptors resulting in relaxation of bronchial smooth muscles causing the bronchi of the lungs to dilate or E, stimulation of cholinergic beta-1 and beta-2 receptors causing stimulatory effects that increase the rate and force of heart contractions. The correct answer is B. In order to answer this question, you must first remember that norepinephrine is the main neurotransmitter released from postganglionic neurons in the sympathetic nervous system. Thus, response A can quickly be eliminated. Norepinephrine would bind to adrenergic receptors, not cholinergic, so we can also eliminate responses D and E. For response C, the rate and force of heart contractions is increased by the sympathetic nervous system, mainly through stimulation of beta-1 receptors. Thus, this is also an incorrect response. For response B, in the video we saw that stimulation of alpha receptors often leads to smooth muscle contraction which would constrict the blood vessels in the bronchial circulation, making B a correct response. Case three. A new patient presents to your practice in relatively good health with a moderately elevated blood pressure. Which of the following treatments would most effectively treat the mild hypertension in this patient? A a drug that blocks beta-1 adrenergic receptors in target tissues, leading to a decrease in heart rate and contractility. B, a drug that blocks nicotinic cholinergic receptors in target tissues, leading to vasodilation of vascular smooth muscle. C, a drug that blocks nicotinic cholinergic receptors in target tissues, leading to vasoconstriction of vascular smooth muscle. D, a drug that stimulates beta-1 adrenergic receptors in target tissues, leading to an increase in heart rate and contractility. Or E, a drug that stimulates alpha-1 adrenergic receptors in target tissues, leading to vasoconstriction of blood vessels. The correct answer is A. 
Stimulation of beta-1 adrenergic receptors typically acts to increase heart rate and contractility, which would raise the blood pressure. Thus, in response A, if we block this neurotransmitter's actions, the patient's blood pressure would drop due to a reduction in the cardiac output. For responses B and C, the parasympathetic nervous system does not play a major role in the constriction or relaxation of vascular smooth muscle. This is one of the few locations that we discussed in which the tug-of-war game between the two divisions of the autonomic nervous system is largely absent. Consequently, we can eliminate responses B and C. For responses D and E, both of the responses are true statements. Stimulation of beta-1 receptors in the heart will increase heart rate and contractility. Stimulation of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors would lead to vasoconstriction of vascular smooth muscle and blood vessels. This is, this is also a true statement. However, if we revisit the case, you will remember that we are trying to reduce the blood pressure of the patient. The drugs given in responses D and E would cause a further increase in blood pressure, which is the opposite of our desired treatment. Thus, response A is the Bent's answer to this case. I hope that these case-based questions have helped you to see how the information we've learned today could apply to your future in the medical field. If you struggled with these questions, please don't feel discouraged as they were designed to help you dive into the material at a very high level. Please feel free to watch this video as many times as needed until you feel comfortable with the material.